Hello, everybody. Welcome to Brookings first webinar and my first webinar that I'm hosting in this new year. I'm Dr. Nicole Turner Lee. I'm a senior fellow in governance studies and I am the director of our Center for Technology Innovation here at Brookings. I'm excited about today for a couple of reasons. I've got some really great panelists that have decided to join me at the start of the year on a topic that I'm quite interested in that I will be releasing a blog around it tomorrow, which is around the need for a tech new deal in America to get people back to work and as a means for economic recovery. I'm also excited about the fact that we're talking about what happens if we do not create this tech new deal to really reinvigorate the type of employment um, and economic recovery that we need for communities of color, particularly black Americans. I would be remiss also to suggest that I am not so excited as we start this webinar on what's happening around us as we're talking about this issue. The reason we need to have this conversation, my friends, is not just because of what has happened in Georgia yesterday, but the fact that as we are debating this conversation this afternoon, that there are folks that are out there that are debating the legitimacy of an election. And I would be remiss as a Brookings scholar not to acknowledge just what that means to essentially try to disenfranchise millions of African Americans and Latinos who voted within this national election. So I want to place that out there because I think it's very important as we talk about this concept of a tech new deal. Let me just say one thing before I introduce our panelists and why this tech new deal is that important to me. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt faced the Great Depression and the stock market had crashed at that time in the 30s, basically what he was dealing with was trying to be creative, courageous enough to figure out a way to get us out. And in getting us out, he came up with a variety of programs, some of which we know today, Social Security, unemployment insurance, et cetera. But all those served as drivers to actually bring people back into what was the existing economy or the emerging economy of the future, getting people back to work and ensuring that they had the worker protections. But as part of that, which is why this webinar is entitled The Tech New Deal for Black America in particular, I don't necessarily present that as only for Black America. I want you to be clear. But there were coalitions that were built during that time under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, where people of color, Blacks and Latinos, also benefited in coalition with whites. And so as we think about what this looks like, it's no secret that technology is driving the way that we live, learn, and earn. So we now need a strategy that combines infrastructure development, adoption and utilization, worker uh, retraining and workforce development on new technological careers, as well as our ability to embrace the fact that tech is the new normal. And what that means going forward, all of the things that we have done in these last 10 months, we need to reinvigorate the economy to welcome startups, to ensure that we have procurements where businesses, particularly those that are minority owned have opportunities, and we are able to benefit from the type of advantages that technology has provided to us. That's why I call it a new deal for tech. And I'm excited again that we'll introduce that tomorrow, but I'm even more excited to share this concept with all of you who are watching us today with a group of people who I think bring different perspectives on why it's important not just to close the digital divide, but to really think about this as the next stage of economic recovery alongside everything we're gonna need to do with the pandemic, healthcare, employment, education, this is equally important that we leverage these new assets that we have to get people back to work. So that's my spiel and I'm sticking to it. And again, I want to be sensitive to what's happening around us as we have this conversation. So every once in a while, you might hear one of the panelists sort of vent. that's okay, because guess what? We're within the context of reality. And if we don't talk about it, those people who are trying to get into the Capitol building definitely aren't going to hear it. So we need to ensure that we keep having these conversations. So today I'm joined by I just cannot tell you how pleased I am to have the Lieutenant Governor Garland Hillcrest of the state of Michigan. I was on a panel with him. I'm an avid watcher of him on, on CNN when he gets up. He's always in that nice backdrop of a big uh, space. I'm sitting in my bedroom and you can't see the bed. But I want to introduce him and thank him for joining us today because I think he comes with a particular unique uh, quality, not just as an elected official, but also someone who has a tech background. Next to him, and I'm not sure what order I'm going in, but what you can see is my dear friend, Jamal Simmons. You've seen him on uh, CBS. He's a news contributor. He's former co-chair of the Inno Internet Innovation Alliance. In addition to that, he has worked on several campaigns and he knows what it's like to actually be part of the conversations to communicate the next wave of economic opportunity. Charlene Stanberry. I would say a lot about this young woman, but she is somebody who, if you don't know her, you need to know her. She's the chief of staff of the office of Congresswoman Yvette Clark. Democratic out of New York. She's also a person who has a background deeply 
eat in telecom policy. That uh, I consider her to be a mentee in many respects because she gets this. And so she's going to contribute from a federal perspective. Joshua Edmonds, he is our person from Detroit. In fact, there are three people from the state of Michigan in some way or form. But Joshua is the director of digital inclusion for the city of Detroit, Michigan. If you don't know him, you also need to know him, but you probably know him as well as what you know Charlene, because both of them are working diligently to close the digital divide. And last and always, certainly not least, I'm happy to be a com uh, in the company of another doctor, Dr. Bella Wilson, who is the founder of Black Tech Futures Research Institute that focuses on the startup community, but she's also the new incoming vice president of policy for the multimedia media MMTC. I used to work there and I'm all chopped up on the name, but look it up. With that in mind, thank you for actually having all of our panelists, and I want to jump right into the conversation. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, I'm going to start with you. First and foremost, I want to start with whatever you have to say about what's going on, but really what I want to also focus on in this Tech New Deal idea is why are we talking about this now, and, and where have we come in these last 10 months to make this issue of getting people economic recovery in addition to skills that are now usable, why is it at the forefront? So doctor, first of all, thank you for pulling us all together and thank you for having this conversation. And it is always the right time to have this conversation, especially with the madness that is happening. I and mean, we are experiencing like euphoria on both ends here, right? There's the euphoria of this historic democratic participation that really put a, put a bookend on the year 2020 and that we've seen in the state of Georgia here to kick off 2021, showing that political participation, the political mobilization of voters of color makes a difference, is electorally decisive in America, in the South, and every place that we choose to present it. And for me, as someone who, you know, spent the second part of my career after being a software engineer, uh, being a community organizer, I find that inspiring and always find it inspiring. At the same time, I am uh, disheartened, I guess, by what I see as the, as the sort of blowback to the blowback of that. When you're seeing people who are rising up to, to try to not only suppress, but outright oppress and fight against uh, the voices of people who are speaking up. And you're seeing the very physical manifestation of that in Washington and in state houses across the country. People are even threatening to do that uh, here in the state of Michigan in our capital of Lansing. But nevertheless, we press forward. And I wanna, I think, ground this conversation um, in, in, a, in a framing that I think will help us think about this in, in the right way. We talk about how we can, we're talking about creating opportunity. We're talking about creating connection to facilitate people rising to fulfill the potential that we know that they have. And I want us to think about this in terms of opening things up, not merely closing things down. One of the things I've never liked about the, the conversation around the quote unquote digital divide is like it's something that we have to eliminate. Like I'm a creator. Like I think we need to be talking about creating pathways to possibility and to connection and to opportunity. Because I think if we are in a creative mindset, a generative mindset, we will come up with more ideas, we will build more relationships, we will imagine new partnerships, we will craft policy that is imaginative. And, and, and I think that's where we need to be in this conversation because what I've seen this year as a statewide leader who has had to respond to a once in 100 year pandemic in Michigan, we had a once in 500 year flooding event in mid Michigan. We've seen these international calls for racial justice. We've seen that we need more people with more ideas to fill more seats at more tables to make more things happen. And the only way we get to more is by more connection. And so certainly technology, you know, one of the ways you can think about technology as the great connector, not only connecting people to the internet through broadband or whatever, but technology create, connects people to the possibility that they can do more than they could do if they didn't have this tool. And so I wanted us to think about this is how can we open up, connect and create opportunity and possibility. And if we're doing that, that will create more chances for, for economic recovery and opportunity for the black community and the punk communities of color that have been hardest hit by this pandemic, for the poor people who were already on the margins of our economy, who were really sort of left hanging, especially in the beginning. But as we look forward, as we find more ways to provide direct economic support and relief to people, as we find more ways to connect more households to the internet that can connect into the opportunities in education, health, wealth building, and all the other things, let's be in that kind of mindset. And I think that's how we're going to be able to move forward in the most productive way. 
And I think that's such a great opening to this conversation, right? Because it sort of shifts us from focusing on what the president is and thinks about how do we get out of this, right? I mean, we, like you said, it's, it's, it's about this connection that we need to make, you know, not just on digital, but the fact that we've been distanced from each other because of this horrible pandemic. Um, just a quick reminder also for folks, please send questions to events at brookings.edu if you have any questions. Um, Joshua, I want to turn to you. I mean, because you sit, as we understand, about four miles where the lieutenant governor is sitting right now in the city of Detroit, but you're also leading this digital inclusion initiative. And as we begin to frame out what this looks like going forward to codify this as policy, as a new deal of some sort, uh, what are you hearing from the ground? Like, are we, years ago when I was doing this, we were told people didn't really want to get online. So we had to deal with this relevance. But are we hearing those kinds of things in the work that you do? And please, also share what you're doing under your uh, initiative as well. A absolutely, and uh, following Lieutenant Governor, I mean, come on. <laughs> um, he said everything that I was gonna say, but like way better. But you know, when we're looking on the ground, um, obviously me being the Director of Digital Inclusion in Detroit, uh, that took a lot of imagination because on the ground, many of your Directors of Digital Inclusion or anyone who's doing this work in the municipal framework, we don't have really any funding to do much of anything. Uh, coronavirus funding, that's um, responsive, which is great, but we're not really armed with things that allow us to be proactive in these discussions. And to get in front of a group of residents or get in front of a city or look a mayor dead in their eye and say, hey, uh, we need to bridge this digital divide. And they're going to say, well, how? With what money? With what resources? And so that, that was a lot of the pressure that came about when I took the role initially. However, what we've been able to do is really look at creating a centralized brand, which is Connect 313. And underneath that brand, we're running several different campaigns, if you will. So on one hand, we're talking about education. And you know, earlier this year, thanks to an, a number of actors, we were able to raise $23 million and, and, and get 51,000 students connected to, to the internet. So it's like, okay, great. But in addition to that, what are we doing for seniors? What are we doing for veterans? What are we doing for everybody else? And so when, when we hear the conversations that are happening in Washington, I think great. But us on the ground, specifically as we talk to residents, it's not enough. We need to do significantly more. And so we've been able to employ the work of uh, celebrities who've actually been able to make cameos on behalf of Connect 3 and 3, which has been great. Uh, we did a video earlier in, in 2020 with Aquaman and Jason Momoa um, and him speaking about the digital divide, him speaking about Connect 3 and 3. But really our whole movement around Connect 3 and 3 was looking at black people specifically in a city that is 85% black, so obviously, but looking at that and what, what cultural components that we take as it relates to technology because so many people make the, the wrong assumption around bridging the digital divide, specifically in communities of color, they'll lead with things like low income. And if you know black people, we're not gonna listen to that dog whistle. It's not like, oh, we're low income, we want the low income or the poor people internet. That's not how we're wired. And so this is just something when on the ground, what we try to do with Connect Through and Through is like, how do you do something bold? How do you do something where people have pride to be a part of this? People want to be connected for these uh, a variety of reasons for which I don't have all the time to go into, but those are the type of things that, again, when we're looking at Connector in 3 and when I'm looking at on the ground in other cities, that has to happen. There needs to be a director of digital inclusion in every city in America, and that person needs to be empowered at the mayor's level. And if they are not empowered, there's not much that can happen. And truth be told, they are losing, and that means that the Black people in those communities are losing twice as much as they're, if they were in another community. So that's just something where, when we're looking at the city of Detroit, we're looking at Connector in 3 we said it before that that should be the national model. And I honestly believe that a city that is 85% black, we're talking about a tech new deal, then that has, that conversation has to intersect directly into Detroit. You know, I think that's so interesting too. And I don't want to date myself because there's some people who are watching this that know me very well. So you better not tweet my age. But when you say a director of digital inclusion, years ago, we used to say that as well. And so it's almost like we're revisiting the same things because we're not institutionalizing while we need to position broadband within communities for economic development. And I think we're going to get back to that because that's just one of the things I'm trying to drive home. I'm working on a book on this. The challenge is, is like you said, we keep placing old models on folks that have already been stripped of the type of enfranchisement that they need to be participative. And Jamal, you and I have gone around the circle, right? Because part of the reason why we find that we probably need to speak in the language of a tech new deal is that we have broken universal service, right? Um, that has not been able to reach the number of people that we need to reach, or we have universal service programs that focus just on one part of the country, like rural, more extensively than urban and rural. Uh, speak to me for a minute in terms of this challenge of basic connections and from a federal perspective, where we should be really attacking you know, the bullseye 
to sort of make this become part of our language. Okay, you'd think after 2,500 Zooms over the course of the last 10 months, I would know how to do this. Um, when you said going around the circle, I think that's a euphemism for going around the sun because we're probably the oldest people on this panel. Um, certainly I am. Um, so, you know, I think about this from this perspective that uh, uh, the number of kids, we were talking about this earlier, I'm from Detroit also, Josh is, uh, lives nearby where I grew up, which is a low income neighborhood um, in the city of Detroit. And I think about the kids who grew up in neighborhoods like the one that I grew up in, who are struggling right now to be connected to school uh, in the midst of this pandemic and some and, and halfway quarantine, and they're trying to do uh, homework, but they're doing it on a on a cell phone and instead of on a laptop like I am or a, or a, or another kind of device. So you go back and you look at the numbers. Uh, the SEC says there are about 21 million people who lack uh, broadband access. Uh, broadband now says that's really like 41 million. And if you think about households that have kids, I think 25% of households between the age of 16 and 17 don't have, um, don't have broadband access, don't have regular um, broadband access at home. Um, and then if you live below $30,000 a year in your household, that number goes from 15%, I'm sorry, of high, of high school, of households with school age kids, 15% to 35% if you have less than $30,000 a year versus a household with $75,000 a year where only 6% of people don't have access, right? So we have an income problem. We have a location problem, rural and in some urban places. We have a demographic problem because it affects Black and Hispanic kids more than it does other kids. And so um, the question is, when we start trying to attract, attack these problems, and I like where Garland, well, the Lieutenant Governor uh, Gilchrist started with this, we've got to be in a creative kind of mindset. Um, you know, a few years ago, uh, I started to try to address this problem myself with, with a project that we did called Crate. And what we did, we did a launch in Detroit, uh, uh, I think four or five years ago, we took, went to a neighborhood, we dropped in a shipping crate inside that shipping crate, we had everything somebody would need to create. So we had like a little uh, area to kind of hang out, we had some tables that people could work on, we got Microsoft to donate uh, the use of some tablets, we put Wi Fi in it. And we had kids from the neighborhood on the east side of Detroit come over they did their homework parents were doing their um uh billing and you know talking to vendors they needed to talk to using the internet so you saw the need for this kind of thing inside a neighborhood and so we should all be in a space where we're not just thinking about what's missing we're thinking about what we can add some of that's going to be from the government some of it's not going to be from government it's going to be from private industry and trying to get private industry to do its part um and i'll close with this uh you know we're we're thinking right now about uh, Vice President Biden, who is making a bunch of appointments and getting people into uh, cabinet agencies. One of the historic groundbreaking uh, agencies he's thinking about changing is the Department of Defense. He's looking at put putting an African-American named Lloyd Austin, a former general, in as DOD secretary. He'd be the first African-American defense secretary. The Department of Defense, just in one, this is just one small program. They spent about $31 million in STEM grants of National Defense Education Program. Um, it, imagine if you up that number, if you doubled that number. Um, the Department of Defense does $360 billion in procurement. About $150, $140 billion of that are things that are not ships, planes, rockets, right? There's there are service contracts that people need. There are lawyers, there are accountants, there are advertising agencies. Uh, when I used to work for uh, Carolyn Kirkpatrick, who was on the Appropriations Committee in the House, we were focused on getting African American advertisers uh, who could, you know, do these commercials for Army of One or Be All You Could Be, talking to all these young kids. But you found there were no black advertising agencies making these ads, talking to these kids. So um, I say all that to say, if we could get the 4% of African American, 4% of federal contracts that go to African Americans. If you get that number up to six or 7%, you could get billions of dollars into black communities and you have young kids who now could get jobs at some of these small and medium sized co companies. You could have uh, people who know they could actually start one of these on their own. And, and you know, when we think about getting young people animated around this, they're not just thinking about you know how they could go get a job someplace. The, the young people that I know, they want to create too. They want to floss. They want to own stuff. They want to be out here and be the ones who are you know out front, you know, selling what, what their product is. We got to give them a pathway and an objective for them to accomplish the goals that they already have inside their bodies and minds. You know, I think that is such a great point. I mean, you've actually brought up a couple of points that I'm going to return to. I mean, one is 
we do have to think about how we actually create these networks in ways that people can become makers, right? Because right now, as it's been mentioned, we're sort of dealing with the digital divide on the passive side, which I think is important because we have to close that those disparities. That digital invisibility is actually not helping us to create the more perfect union that we need to accelerate business growth. But the second thing what you're saying is, we have to focus in on workforce. And I'm gonna come back to some of the more of the details of the technical deal that I'm referring, referring to, but Charlotte, I wanna to turn to you. You know, part of this conversation, what Jamal sort of insinuated is, is that we need to pay attention to the next generation of the workforce. And honestly, we need to pay attention to the people who are not working today and the role that they can play. Your member is very much active in the Smart Cities Caucus. She's been a, a huge uh, person who is a, a pro-technology. Um, how do we begin to look at workforce development? Because again, when Roosevelt did this, it was a multiple components of his New Deal. Worker protection was really important, but workforce really was at the core of that. What do we need to be doing as well in terms of the workforce area to ensure that people of color, Black people are benefiting from these new jobs? Absolutely. So thank you, Dr. Uh, Nicole Turner Lee, who happens to be my mentor, uh, just so that everybody knows that um, workforce development is, is key. I remember I was just talking to my mother. Um, she just retired recently after so many years working at Southern Bell, Bell South, Baby Bells, AT&T. And she was telling me at that time, that was the job to get, right? That was the job that had good wages. You had a pension, plus you're in telecom and tech, which is just an innovative industry to be in, right? So now what we're seeing is, you know, on a federal level, tech isn't as regulated. So it's a very innovative and a very creative industry that we're in right now. And a lot of our millennials and Gen Zers are just running with that. Um, they're creating these new ideas and they can just come up with a concept, get money. I know Dr. Fallon's gonna talk about it, right? And then they can just, they'll be entrepreneurs. Um, some will become angel investors. So when it comes for, to workforce development, I think it's been key with Congresswoman Clark and particularly, especially with the Congressional Black Caucus because that is the next wave of how we're going to be able to not only support the next set of ge uh, generation that we have going on, but also it's the way for us to get into these industries in which we're not as represented. Okay. So for example, Congresswoman Clark is a co-chair of the Smart Cities Caucus. We've made it a point to make it a bipartisan caucus. Um, so we had Congresswoman Susan Brooks as our co-chair before it was Congressman Daryl Issa. And the reason for that is we wanted to focus on issues from a bipartisan basis to where when we have bills that come up, we're gonna make sure that it's getting passed in Congress, that there aren't any gridlocks. So with the Smart Cities Caucus, workforce development is one of our pillars. And for example, we had a bill called the Tower Infrastructure Development Act. And that act specifically asked for the FCC to create an advisory committee to talk about 5G, to talk about uh, next generation of broadband, next generation of TV, and what can we do in regards to building a workforce in these um, particular communities that look like us, these underrepresented communities. So what can we do to make investments for HBCUs? What can we do to make investments for MSIs, minority serving institutions, or HSIs, uh, Hispanic serving institutions? What can we do to make investments in these tribal lands, when it comes to workforce development, when it comes to building out towers, when it comes to building out anything that's needed when it, in 5G, because this is the 21st century workforce and we need to make sure that we are a step ahead and that we're not a step behind and that we're not, we're being proactive and not reactive. So what you're going to see in this 117th Congress is you're going to see the CBC, the CHC, which is the Hispanic Caucus, you're gonna see KPAC, you're gonna see all of us join together when it comes to marginalized communities and making sure that when there is 5G deployment, that our students, that our children are not left out in regards to these workforce development opportunities that are going to help them in the future and help build their families. Wow, yeah, I, I'm gonna fail and I'm gonna get to you, Dr. Wilson, from the Multicultural Media Telecom and Internet Council. Marita would kill me if I said it wrong, so I had to correct myself. But Lieutenant Governor, I wanna jump to you really quickly though, because I think this is what Charlene is talking about and where we are so far in the conversation. And again, for those of you listening, send questions to events at brookings.edu. 
We're gonna retweet the heck out of this this paddle. Tech New Deal is the hashtag. Tech New Deal. Lieutenant Governor, you're listening to all this, right? And we're putting these pieces together. The workforce side, I gotta ask you your, your opinion on that because I think that these new jobs are livable wage scale jobs. Jobs in 5G are paying good money, but yet there's no occupational code for them. Uh, people don't know the skills that are needed to actually work on these power projects. Why is this an integral part of actually getting people back to work? Well, when you're talking about workforce, I think you need to think about the pipeline what can set a person on a path to choose to pursue a career, choose to start a business in a particular industry? And so in Michigan, we've tried to think about pipeline and we put in place an initiative in 2019 called 60 by 30. We want every person in Michigan to have a post high school uh, degree or professional credential uh, before the year 2030, 60% of adults. And so in order to do that, we need to widen the pathways to those credentials. And part of that is recognizing that as industry evolves, the way that we approach credentialing must evolve as well. So we actually have put, you know, put program on the ground to do this. We started something called the Michigan Reconnect program that will provide a tuition-free pathway to any credential for any adult in the state of Michigan. Any and every adult in the state of Michigan can do that tuition-free. It's a state investment in this. The Futures for Frontliners program that we started this year is the only once in a only one in the country that's using CARES Act dollars to literally pay for college degrees for people who've been on the front lines working during the pandemic. And the reason that I say that and mention it in this context is because people of color are overrepresented in those frontline workers, certainly in the state of Michigan. I think that's true nationally as well. Now, we have a path for people to sort of go there and, and pursue those professions. Now, the next step is we have also issued a challenge to industry, a challenge to, to employers, a challenge to the innovators to say, you need to be transparent about what it takes to contribute to this industry, to contribute to the success of your company and work with us and work with educational institutions to define what those pathways are. If we need to create new licenses, we need to create new credentials, we need to create new programs, well, let's go forward and do that. And you're seeing it on every and everything from, I mean, look, before I even took office, I actually worked with Wayne County Community College, which is the county that um, where Detroit is, um, to lay the foundation for a credentialing program for, for, for professionals to work on LIDAR technology for autonomous vehicles. And so again, there's the, but there was no, there's no like professional certification for being a LIDAR technician, or at least there wasn't in Michigan. But now we're working to create that. So we will need to do that for people who are servicing um, 5G small cell infrastructure, for people who are um, servicing all of these different last mile projects, for people who are going to service, you know, our inter interstellar providers. You know, right? We have a lot. We have a lot of different types of work to be done, and there are people who are hungry to learn how to do it. People who are hungry to create the types of businesses that will be able to flourish there and to they can go employ uh, Michiganders across the board on it. So I'm excited about the opportunity that that's opened up. And so uh, we need to tackle this from all angles, a regulatory perspective, a licensing perspective, an education and inspiration perspective. And if we do those things, then we have pathways to opportunity. You know, I love that because of recent, I've been in these conversations around credentialing, right? Because we used to think that you had to be an engineer or have a PhD or be a scientist, but really, you know, again, going back to this idea of this panel, which is around this new deal, the idea is that these are jobs that we're going to need. The same way we're going to build the roadways for our cars, we need to build this information supply highway. And we need to make sure that there are programs, much like Charlene said, where the government helps with credentialing and skilling and apprenticeships to actually offset our need to actually get people up to speed. But I want to say this. You know, obviously, as we talk about the New Deal for America, it's not just about trying to figure out ways to sort of put people into certain boxes. We do have folks that are out there creating the same tools and, and products and services that we have been sustaining us for the last few months. Um, I just read on LinkedIn, and I'll turn to you, Dr. Wilson, about two young African-American guys who now have a grocery store app that is actually gaining high traction just by recognizing that people are no longer going to grocery stores. You come out of a community of ecology building when it comes to uh, Black tech startups. Would love to hear what is the call that we need to make to the federal government and to private sector to get more money to those innovators who are also going to be part of our economic recovery. Oh, I so want to 
answer the question about higher ed because I'm a former professor. Oh, go ahead. Can, I, can I just put a little point, a yeah, little point on it and to say that you're right, all of these jobs are up and coming. But one thing we know about the data and the research, first generation black college students major in low earning, but socially impactful majors and they go into those careers. So whatever type of higher ed training are we choosing we need to do, it needs to be from a social impact perspective. And it should be from a social justice lens. Even when we look at the data across race and, and ask students, why do you do STEM? Why do you do computer science? Oh, I do it. None people of color would say, I want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. I want to be disruptive. I want to have like, I want to build a billion dollar unicorn business. African-American and Latino students say, I want to help my community. And so as we think about like entree and entrance, student driven interest in learning, I'm sorry, I'm such a researcher and a professor in this way. You have to frame it in a way that people really want to do the jobs. I may not want to go attach a, a pole to a cable in order to get internet into the homes, but if he told me it was going to have impact on my community and my grandmother would be able to see her granddaughter who she misses so desperately in Houston, then, then maybe I would go into it. And so it's not just about having the jobs is how we frame them. And also recognizing that people's interest drives their ability to learn. So I'll put that right there. To your question but, about- Dr. Tech Fowler, Fowler, Dr. Ahead, Fowler can I just, put a, can I, can I just yeah, yeah. Have, uh, uh, hop on this for a second? Cause I don't want you to let it go. I think this thing that you're talking about is incredibly important. I think a lot about this aspiration. I mean, those of us who are further along in our lives, it's hard to put your mindset Thank back you. to- you look really young. <laughs> but it's hard to put your mind back to where you were when you were 15, 16, 17, 20 years right. old. And it was all about aspiration and what you wanted to be and how you wanted to grow and develop and whatever it was. And so I always think about like, if you told somebody they, they were going to get a job filling sandbags and like you can get this great job, you can make $10 an hour filling sandbags that you want to go do it. Like who wants to go do, go, wants to go fill sandbags outside in the hot sun? That sounds horrible. Right. But if you told somebody you could go build the Hoover Dam, which is the biggest national, you know, natural uh, uh, man-made structure in North America. You'll be part of history. People will be looking at this from outer space. You can go get a job building the Hoover Dam. Now that right. sounds interesting. Now, when you get there, your first job might be filling sandbags, <laughs> right? But you're going <laughs> to learn something that's going to contribute to something bigger than right. just your own individual place. And I think when we're talking about this with people, we have to be thinking like this. We have to be thinking about the big idea that can animate people People and innovate them and make them want to participate. So I'm just glad you brought that no, up. No, and, no, I, and no, I love. No. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm I'm sorry. Dr. Wilson, no. real quick on, in Jamal, because I want you to jump into this Black tech piece. Jamal, what you're talking about is so important because, again, going back to Roosevelt, it was all about the Tennessee Valley Authority. It was about putting together something that was going to have an impact the rest of our lives. And that's something we need to do with tech. We're not passive consumers of technology. We're actually, I, I, you know, we have ideas and we're innovative. So that, that was my two cents. I'm sorry, Val, you know, moderate. Oh, no, 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 no. We'll do it again. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, 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 it's all good. Girl, this is your show. We are just happy to be able to talk about community and blackness and greatness. But to your point, the, the key here, once again, is that students are telling you that they want to have social impact. They want to change lives. And when I think about the emerging field of public interest technology, and Joshua and I had a great conversation about that, um, we need to begin thinking about the credentialing, credentialing processes for that as we begin to get more people like you and I, even though you've already been in government as an example, into these new jobs at the municipal level where Joshua is, or at this national level now I find myself at, right? And trying to begin developing the networks of people to do this work, right? Because let's also be clear, the reason why we have certain middle class is because we had government jobs. And if there's going to be a need between government and this new world of technology, and our students are saying to us, and even our former non-traditional students, that's a growing body, right, are saying that they want to understand and impact this world of tech. And I'm not a technologist by training, I'm a researcher, but I learn everything I can in order to translate this world. And so that's an alternative tech pathway, and that's some of my research too. But to Nicole's point of tech startups, um, as we well know that by April 2020, um, the Federal Reserve in New York said that we had about 40% of Black business go under. I said 40% in April. We are in now January 2021, and we are thankful for the PPP and the CARES Act dollars, but we need way more moving forward. And of course, the question would be capital. Of course, we need debt-free capital. We need patient capital. We need flexible capital. We need, and I, I'm going to say a friend of mine would say, we just need free money. 
um, with no strings attached, no interest. I know, I see you, Lieutenant Governor, but I believe you said imagination, so I'm giving you all my imagination hey, right hey, now. No, that, that, that facial expression was one good, because because I listen, I'm not an economist, but I do know that when people have money, stuff typically works better. Yeah. So, like, I hear you. <laughs> I mean, like... But, but, see, but the big piece for me, so you said, I love that you started with imagination. For me, the larger thing is, yes, the capital is immediate. We all know this. We just don't want to give the money. But why not support on the ground what the Kaufman Foundation calls, shout out to the Kaufman, they fund some of my research, um, supporting tech entrepreneurship support organizations. These are the organizations that are located within cities that have, were founded by former founders of color, right? In order to navigate how to, how to get capital to businesses, tech businesses in their cities, right? But what I love about them even more so is that they become anchor cornerstone ecosystem building organizations for technology. So, and, and Joshua would know this because he works at the municipal level, that if you have like a uh, organization like Cold Fever in Miami, Nola Vade in New Orleans, um, Martyr in Cincinnati, um, Black and Tech Nashville in Nashville, these organizations are helping Black founders, but they're also the front line when it comes to anything about innovation and STEM in a city. Let's be very clear, our, our non-people of color tend to not to go look very easily to find us to talk about these amazing things. And they immediately go to business and to folks who are helping tech businesses. And so across the country, we have at least 200 of these organizations locally, right? Who are, some of them are part of Black Tech Futures Research Institute, which is the work that I do, um, and are trying to figure out how to build an innovation culture. How do you sustain an innovation Black Tech liberatory culture in a municipality and not at the national level. Joshua, I'm throwing that to you. No, and you know, I, 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 I like this conversation so far. So I wanna kind of couch this because we have an audience now who is listening to this. And, I, and, and again, for those of you that are watching, when I put out this blog, you know, I'm talking about a tech new deal for all of America, but it's particularly important, again, as we saw in the 1930s, to bring in people who have been disenfranchised, who have been underskilled into this new economy. That's where I think the aspirations of, of future economic growth comes from. And it's honestly going to help the type of reconciliation that we need in this country. We all have to be in to make this work, to get out of this pandemic. And what's interesting to me, and I'll throw it out to anybody right now, I mean, who do we need to be talking to? Because obviously these kinds of connections have to be made in a very coherent, you know, uh, transparent and ecological way, right? Where you can say, we need money for infrastructure for this reason. We need to ensure that people who are building that infrastructure are trained. We need to make sure that we also set out some capital potentially from the federal government to have people chip in where needed to create jobs within their own communities. I don't know who wants to take this one, but who should we be talking to outside of President-elect Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris? I'm gonna let Josh take it. <laughs> <laughs> I did unmute myself and I think that we're all gonna have a, a different person because obviously we should be talking to a lot of different people. But my, my um, and I'm not shied away from this and I do share an appointment at the FCC, but. Yep, this, this is, I'm taking it to the FCC on this one. Specifically, and I know that this is a, a, a conversation that's been happening a lot on the Hill uh, around our definition of broadband, but me revisiting that is just something that it, it has to happen because as we're talking about jobs, uh, you know, 25-3, that doesn't really afford creatives the opportunity to really become the content producers that they can be. And so if I'm looking at Black people specifically as content create creators, that's across all platforms, whether that's TikTok, Instagram, I don't know all of them, so that's just where I'm gonna stop. Um, those, are, those are the cases where um, if we're looking at how we define high-speed internet in America, I really think that we are doing ourselves a disservice by looking at this provider language in a way that we're just gonna be taking in content opposed to uploading it, opposed to actually pushing the needle and, and creating solid revenue streams. We see how much YouTubers make. We know that it's a ridiculous amount of money. And so specifically, um, when we looked at last year, right around the time of the pandemic right in March, when it first started, that's when Chairman Pai at the time had implemented the Keep America Connected pledge. That was, you know, great, glad, glad we got to see it. But as soon as he did that, I remember Comcast improving their speed because last year for their program or in 2018 for their program for um, uh, Internet Essentials, it was 15-3. As soon as that Keep America Connected pledge came online, it went to 25.3. That is high-speed internet, that's the standard. The FCC has the power to move that standard up, and I think your other providers are then gonna respond accordingly. And so this is just something where for me, 
I'm pro, I'm saying FCC. Now that's not the only people, but that's where I would like to see that because on the ground in Detroit, that would mean the world for us to be able to point to and say, hey, instead of having one low cost internet provider, now we're looking at high speed internet in a completely different way. And now we're actually able to get in front of people and say that, look, you want to become that next person or this next whatever culture creator, influencer, whatever. We are now removing those barriers specifically from an infrastructure standpoint. Perfect. Okay, who else are we talking to? Okay, go ahead. Can I, Jamal, can I get on just uh, just a pig? Uh, our friend Kim Tignor, uh, who started something called Creative Control. Since you brought this up, Josh Edmonds, and people seem to know they go to Creative Control and you're just creating a product. You need to protect the thing that you're creating, and she has a lot of resources for people. So as you're doing all this creativity online, somebody's not coming in, culture vulturing, and taking your stuff and selling it behind your back and you can't get the money for it. So Jamal, I need to put that in my blog. I'm gonna put a sentence in there. If you're gonna create it, <laughs> protect it. <laughs> so Kim exactly. Tignor, creative control, you are completely right. Um, go ahead. Who are we talking to? Charlene, you wanna jump in? Talk to me. No, um, <laughs> I, I would definitely say that utilizing members of Congress um, since we're talking about, you know, for marginalized communities, particularly black communities, definitely Congressional Black Caucus. Um, Congressional Black Caucus, we have a tech diversity working group. Uh, my boss, she's co-chair of Smart Cities Caucus. There's also a tech accountability caucus. But the other thing I just kind of want to discuss is we always need witnesses for hearings. We need people, we need stories, right? We need stories that come from on the ground, what's happening, you know, actual people. So I think definitely talking to members of Congress and being able to provide those stories helps. Um, it helps them when we have these hearings to discuss what's, what, how much money we're going to give to the FCC, right? When it comes to what, how much money we're going to invest in particular pipeline programs in education, pipeline programs and apprenticeships. So I definitely would say members of Congress, because members of Congress kind of serve as a convener for all different types of groups, including our civil rights groups, including our consumer groups, um, including our regular technology companies, they can bring anybody to the table. That's right. Uh, and so it's important. I'm going to take a risk and mix a couple of metaphors because I was watching The Lion King with my twins last night. So um, there's a very cyclical, almost sort of circle of life uh, nature to I think we think about. And the, the, the second metaphor is as a former basketball player, like we all have a role to play here. Like everybody on the court has a job to do. And so I think if we think about this in terms of we have three levels of government represented on this panel, and then we have uh, researchers, advocates, and practitioners represented on this panel as well. But everybody has something that they need to do. So if you think about like at the federal government level, what's the federal government's job? The federal government is where all the money is, first of all. But also uh, the federal government has the power, as Josh said, to set standard and definition, to, to, to set broad direction. And so one of the things that we all need to do is make sure the federal government is doing that in a responsible and equitable and just way. Mm -hmm. At the state level, our responsibility is then to, to channel those federal resources to make sure that there are equitable and well-structured and accessible conduits for those resources then to flow in an accountable way to local institutions. And then at the municipal level, the job is to listen to people who are being served on the ground and then to design program that will meet their needs, demand, circumstances, and be responsive. And then the folks who are participating in those, they are then the creators of those stories that then get fed back to, the, to other levels of government. So get fed back to, to, to Congress or to get fed to the FCC or whatever it is. And that cycle continues. So I think if we think about um, the role that we all can play at every level, I think that'll that'll help us understand that we do need to talk to everyone and we need to make sure that we're having the right conversation with people at the right level. And, right. and I would also add, I'm just gonna jump in super quick. Um, on one level, we need to be talking to the National Chamber of U.S. Um, commerces, um, those who, the chambers, they need to know because they're creating economic community development plans for their season, um, for their citizens, um, for their municipalities, and also smart city plans. Yes. We have yes. to get a hand on that because most of them, number one, are often centered around the construction of product and IoT products and, 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 and information and making government great, but not, many of them do not have human capital 
um, attributes to think about how do you really have a smart citizen and a smart community beyond the technology and the infrastructure question. And then secondly, because I always will say no matter what panel I am on, if we're talking specifically about African-American people, we have to talk about faith communities and we have to talk about black churches. Ask me why. We have a translation problem. I believe the FCC has a translation problem. I think that they do great regulatory work, but you ask my cousin, my grandmother, my auntie, and they are across various class dimensions. What does the FCC do? It's like, um, is that a news channel, Fallon? And I'm like, Mm, kind of, sure. I think I think it really is talking and getting with our community stakeholders and our faith communities to translate this world because they translate death, life, hope, all of these esoteric concepts to try to make people to be better. I, I can't see why they can't translate interoperability, telecommunications, and be able to have a more nuanced conversation because I agree with you, I'm losing the governor about the levels, but the power is always on the people. And if the mm. people are not educated and the people cannot translate and people don't understand, it will always be a beltway politics of national inclusion and not thinking about the people who really we design these institutions to help. Yeah, and I, I want to jump into this question because this is now, I think, going to where I wanted this conversation to go from Madeline. You know, part of, Fallon, you just hit it. I mean, part of the challenge is translating these uh, programs to everyday people but also making the connection and somebody said it earlier that we're not talking about digital access for the purpose of consumption only. So Madeline says, well, what best practices do we need to employ to incorporate workforce development into digital inclusion and literacy work, right? So it's not separated. Um, and how do we transition that knowledge into good paying jobs that set people up for successful careers? Because I think that was part of the simpleness of, of 1933. It was like, go build a bridge, a dam and a road. <laughs> And now we're talking about go build an interoperable system, uh, a pole, fiber. So what needs to be done to ensure that we're bringing these worlds together? Um, anybody want to answer that? I think you have to take an ecosystem approach to it. I think part of the challenge of why we have had the digital divide, the digital gap, and we, we all have all these names, tech disparities, racial tech disparities, digital inclusion, tech inclusion, is because we have not been able to tell a concise story on how all of these various systems intersect, intersectionality, right, and create compounded, what Kay Porcenter calls leaky tech pipelines for black people to advance in this world. In particular, the work that I do around black tech ecosystems is tries to really get a story on how does K through 12 affects post-secondary, affects how you get in and retain in tech companies, how you decide to leave a tech company to start your own tech business, and what are the government policies and issues that shape it and how it creates either opportunity or compounded oppression. And I think the reason why we like to talk about it episodically or in silos is because people don't want to fund the whole system. Everybody wants to be, have their special program that many of our platforms and ISPs give, which I'm very thankful for them. I say, I say, I say, <laughs> but having a more, I have to say that I work for MMTC now. Um, and so, it, but, but there really is, the challenge is having a combined narrative and forcing people to listen because everybody wanna talk about computer science episodically. When Obama was talking about CS for All, everybody was about CS for All. When we're talking about Connect Home, everybody's talking about connecting housing, but there's never an enduring conversation on how the beginning of the pipeline and broadband access is that foundation affects all other ways of how we get tech innovators, influencers on TikTok and how we get people at the top levels of our tech companies and also, side note, how we hold them accountable for how they use our data and our information. But you can't get it unless you tell an integrated ecosystem story of racial tech disparities. Right. So yeah, I, think, I, 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 I think that in addition to that, I mean, something that was in your question was this question of literacy. And I think when we're talking about translation and things like that, you're, you're talking about creating fluency with the concepts, right? And in Michigan, so one of the Things. We, we tried to look at this question of sort of sort of broadband access really with three as, as three legs to a stool. One of them is uh, literal access as infrastructure. One of them is affordability, which is you know um, actually so people can afford it, <laughs> which is very simple. And then the third is that literacy component, which says that because without that literacy 
you know, having an asset that you can afford, but that you are not able to fully embrace due to the lack of understanding or experience or whatever um, means that you don't take full advantage of it. And right. so we need to position, um, so we need to invest in solutions that address that gap in literacy as well. And so that's what gets into some of the stuff that Dr. Wilson was talking about in terms of, you know, how, what kinds of people and institutions are we leaning on to be able to do that translation work? Cause yeah, cause like you said, making death make sense is a hell of a lot more complicated than making broadband make sense, right? Yeah. But, so, but for whatever reason, we don't believe that people's expertise and ability to do that, to, to handle those, those complicated concepts like translates over here for some reason. And that, and that the reasons we don't accept that uh, are wrapped up in all sorts of racial prejudice that we have a whole other panel discussion about. But I think we need to, we need to embrace and, and, and take on these challenges of literacy with the same fervor that we do uh, access and affordability. I think that will help in this ecosystem approach. So yeah, I, I like what Dr. what Dr. Wilson um, said about uh, the strategy and us getting focused on like broad, uh, not just everybody focusing on a little piece, but like the strategy. And, and part of that is, you know, um, I think one of the things we've learned in this pandemic is that uh, these tools that in many ways are also complicating our lives by broadcasting falsities and, and bad things. But they're also, I don't know how we would have survived the last year, right, the last 10 months without things like, you know, Zoom and Facebook and all the things that have allowed us to stay connected. Now for people who have to get up and go to work every day, they're frontline workers, they can't stay home and have a conversation like this in their, in their houses, they have to be out in the midst of this virus. But for the rest of us, we've been able to stay sane as much as we can, right? And stay, uh, stay in, involved and employed in many ways because of these tools. But the question is, how do we access, how do we get everybody else access? So you know, we talk a lot about, you know, rising tides lift all boats. I think we've learned that's not necessarily true. Um, we do have to raise the tide. The tides have to raise because we're seeing as, a, as an economy, as a country, um, there's places where we're falling behind as an entire aggregated society. So we've got to raise the tide, but we also have to power some boats, right? We got to, some of these boats need to have extra power so that they can catch up to the rest of the boats, you know, and make sure that we're not leaving people behind. And there's no way, I, I think about it like this. I don't know anybody who has who has been more creative than poor people and people who need resources because you have to be like from your mama who could figure out me and my wife were talking about how we were growing up and our moms used to you know find random pieces of vegetables and food and put together and you have like this stew that you could eat you thought it was pretty good you didn't realize it was like a bunch of leftover scraps but it was good and so what you want is you want to have innovative people have access to the tools to create innovative products um, and then have the financing to grow and get onto that ladder. And, and, and the history of American capitalism when it grows and it's well is that you have somebody who doesn't necessarily create it, but figures out how to assemble it the right way, right? Like Henry Ford didn't create the car. Or he didn't create the assembly line. He just figured out how to put, put those things together the right way. Puffy didn't know how to make music. He just figured out how to bring music and artists and, and old stuff together to make the right way. So we got to find a way to get those people the right way, get them the financing and technical assistance to be able to grow and get those companies out into the world and then make sure other people know that they, they exist and they get the chance to do the same thing. So I raise the tide and then power the boats. So well, yep, go ahead. <laughs> the, 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 what I'm definitely gonna add to this because I the, the ecosystem approach specifically from a best practice standpoint, I think that there are a lot of communities who are definitely building some type of ecosystem um, and it's not really conveying the investment capital that they need. The investment capital isn't just investments from, I'm not even talking from an angel investing standpoint, I'm literally saying, federal government intervention <laughs> that is worthy enough to be able to get the investments that we need. So um, from, from, from a, I guess, frontline digital equity standpoint, there's always been this huge elephant in the room around data. We all know it. The American Community Survey is what all of us use, but it's not enough. And we know it's not enough. The federal government knows it's not enough. That's how they're able to classify us as an underserved city, not deserving of any of the $16 billion that the FCC allocated to rural America. I would digress on that point, but realistically, when we're looking at a best practice standpoint, yes, on the data piece, but also on that total ecosystem um, coordination approach. So when Dr. Fallon mentions the faith community, absolutely, <laughs> like that is when we began looking at the, the, the hearts of these communities, it still rests with that faith community. I might not attend, I'm a son of a minister. Like I said, I might not go, but I already know when I hear these things where I need to be, I know. 
And so these are the type of things that we all still share. Uh, specifically when we began looking at, um, and I, I'm going to give credit to the Lieutenant Governor uh, on this, uh, specifically around the state's racial disparities task force and the coronavirus. So Michigan, obviously we had a, a, a very pronounced rate, specifically black people in Detroit. And when we began looking at that racial disparities task force, one of the things that we were able to do within Connect 3 and 3 is get $4 million allocated to connecting our seniors. That still lives under Connect 3 and 3. So earlier you heard me make mention of um, um, us getting all the tablets and devices to the high school students. That was connected futures. Now we're talking about connecting seniors. All of these things are best practices rooted in our data and rooted in this total ecosystem activation approach where we are locking arms and we're making a unified case. Detroit cannot be the anomaly there. We need all these communities working together in tandem with the respected levels of governance. That is the, the that, that's the community of practice that needs to happen at scale. And if that does not happen, we do not get the resource allocated anywhere that's in an effective way. That's just to say it, um, just because I, I want to highlight that, Josh, I'm glad you mentioned that, because that, that's what I was talking about earlier in terms of looking what happens at every role. So that $4 million uh, rapid response initiative grant that Josh is talking about to Connect 313, so that was federal CARES Act dollars, mm -hmm funneled through a process that was established by the Michigan Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities, which I chair, which set up a rapid response initiative to respond to um, helping address some of the social determinants of health that have made, made communities of color more vulnerable to public health challenges, which then in turn led to resources funneled to this local program to help address a, a broad need in the community. So I think that's, that, is a, that is a literal example of what I was describing earlier and thinking about the roles that we can play to try to optimize resources. Charlene, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, I just wanna add something because I'm thinking back to my childhood and how I learned about technology or telecom and it was through the Urban League, right? It was through different types of programs. I think I was a midnight achiever, right? And then I remember being at the Urban League, my father being there, my mother being there. I think that we also need to think about these trusted organizations that are within our communities. Dr. Fallon Wilson talked about churches. Churches definitely also need to think about our fraternities and our sororities, about Urban League, NAACP, National Action Network. There are a lot of organizations that have chapters on the ground that are trusted sources to teach our communities and to expose our kids and to expose our parents and expose our seniors to utilization of technology, but also how do you become creators of it also. Yeah. And to that last point, just a, a quick example, the reason yep. why we should be focusing on those types of organizations, I love what Michigan is doing, Detroit, shout out to the North, was Midwest, y'all are Midwest, but Southern states and Southern cities where you're not the majority of African Americans and you have 20% or 12% trying to do this work is very challenging, right? When you have an assembly in a state legislature that doesn't look like you, or you, or you don't have a Lieutenant Governor that is about equity and about visionary things. And so where, how do you get the money for equity and where, does it, where should they flow when you give the monies to states, right? They need to flow through those organizations. Yeah. They are the ones that can help people like me in Nashville, right? It took me eight months to raise $200,000 over the last seven months to do a citywide digital inclusion assessment so that black and brown people could tell me how they felt, think, experienced technology in order to pair that hopefully with broadband maps. We can talk about that later. Um, so that we can have a more robust story on what black and brown people are experiencing in a Southern city where they're not the majority in order so one day we can raise 35 million, or they could actually give us 35 million. So the second stimulus job, right, that's coming down. But it doesn't work like that for all cities. And, and, and it goes back to black power in black that's institutions. Right. That's right. I, I want to do one more thing before we go, Nicole. There was a, a you asked at the very beginning, who, we, who should we be talking to or what can we do in terms of the federal government? I just wanted to highlight this because um, a couple of years ago, the uh, general accounting office, the GAO, put out a report saying that although that there have been this expansion in um, federal contracting with tech companies and tech workers, that in, in some minorities, particularly Latinos and Asians, 
black work, there was no expansion in black workers, no expansion in women inside federal uh, uh, tech workforces. So the companies that the, co the government contracted with tech companies, those tech companies did not hire more African-Americans and more women to work in them. So one of the things this report recommended is that the labor department and the federal office of contract compliance would set goals and standards about uh, hiring and making sure that they were expanding their workforce. They had six recommendations. People could look it up. But there's a GAO report. And so if you get, I, I bet you that in the Trump, that this was on the end of the Obama administration. Yep. In the Trump administration, they did not focus on this. This was not a priority. Um, so I think as people are engaging around this with the Biden administration, some questions around how they're contracting, what are the workforces look like in the companies they're contracting with, and you know whether or not they can uh, set some standards and tracking to make sure they're growing people of color inside those workforces. So I, I got to stop us for a minute because we're running out of time. But I, I, first and foremost, I, let me just summarize what I heard and, and then just sort of pivot us out of here. You know, obviously, we started this conversation on the fact that this country is hurting right now. I'm going to close with just some final comments on what's happening as we actually talk right now. But for the most part, we've got to get people back to work. And I think what you've heard from all the panelists is that we have populations, particularly communities of color, that we need to place in positions to not just be aspirational in terms of goals, but to find a way to codify this, to concretize these goals so that we establish policies and programs like a new deal that will actually bring a variety of folks back to the workplace and ensure that they're part of the creation of this new economy. With that being the case, just things I think you heard today and things you'll see in my blog tomorrow. Obviously, it starts with what universal service reform looks like in this country. It's very important that we go back and we modernize that to be much more embracing of all the folks that exist that need this type of help. It also points to what we do locally to support digital inclusion projects at the local level, like in the city of Detroit, where there are ambassadors that are out there who need additional funding and the right types of public-private partnerships to make this work. In addition to that, we need workforce development training, apprenticeships, credentialing, pipeline, intentional pipeline mapping uh, that will help us actually move forward. And the third thing I think we heard today is we need self-determination of our in entrepreneurs as well as individual people in the communities that are looking for a way to get involved, but they need access to capital. They need access to procurement from federal governments and state governments and municipalities. And they also need some diversity and inclusion goals that exist in companies. My friends, when I said that the New Deal was a great model, of course it didn't work as well as we thought it would. And of course it had a lot of intervention in terms of government wanting to create all these new agencies. Going forward, we need something because we have too many people that are not going to benefit as producers in the new digital economy. And I think overall, as we wrap this up, and I would be remiss if I didn't say this because those of you who follow me often know that I'm this type of person. We need common vision and common language. And I think the Lieutenant Governor and other people on this panel would agree what is happening right now at the state capitol is beyond um, something that we should be experiencing in the 21st century. It should be beyond our intelligence to have to tell our kids what's happening with regards to the disruption of democracy. And it should be beyond our morals and values in American society to experience this. But we have to get people back to work and get them back to a healthy state to rebuild our economy. And fortunately, as been said by this panel as I wrap up, tech has become one of those drivers. So stop placing us at the 10th part of the marker and make us part of the cure and the remedy to actually be part of the economy. Private sector has done it, but maybe with a little bit of government attention, we actually may be able to bolster the type of connectivity needs that people in America have. I'm writing a book. It's coming out this year, finally, on the digital divide, digital invisible, digitally invisible, how the internet is creating the new underclass. Please follow us at our podcast at Tech Tank at the Center for Technology Innovation. And I want to say to all of you, please be safe out there. Um, right now, we got to be safe. We got to make sure we pray. And we got to make sure we get out of this with some solutions that are going to allow us to look at this memory and say we are back to some level of normalcy. Thank you very much. I'm Nicole Turner Lee from the Brookings Institution. Thank you, everybody, too. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.